Well, you've heard about some of the criticism of the help. It goes sort of, both the book and the movie, it goes sort of like this. Uh, it's just a white person's view of the black experience. Well, coming up, we're going to have the African-American view of the African-American experience in the horrors of slavery. Now, all that, when we talk to Sharon Ewell Foster about her book, The, Resur the Resurrection of Nat Turner, Part 1, The Witnesses. All on North Carolina Book Watch, next. Funding for North Carolina Book Watch is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV, and by the North Carolina Humanities Council. Welcome to North Carolina Book Watch. I'm D.G. Martin. And our guest is Sharon Ewell Foster. She's the author of The Resurrection of Nat Turner, Part One, The Witnesses. Welcome. Well, thank you so much for having well, me. Well, we're thrilled to have you, although you were born in Texas and raised mostly in Illinois. Yeah. And uh, you spent most of your time working as a Defense Department employee really all over the country, I guess. Yes, yes. I was in New Jersey, um, um, Rhode Island. The Washington area did two stints at the Pentagon, even Alabama, so I've been a lot of places. Well, well, and, and in doing that, uh, I mean, you worked your way up into the point where you were training all these soldiers and others. Um, yeah, yeah, I taught military instructors how to teach. Uh, um, so uh, lots of great stories about um, uh, working with the Marines and uh, people in the Air Force and in the Army love them. I still love them. I think that's one of the most romantic jobs. Even though well, I, well, I guess you, we don't offer. No, no, of course romantic. you're going to write a book about this, and then we're going to talk about that. Yeah. But, um, well, the the other thing is that you're now Tar Heel. You've been in North Carolina. You've been living Durham, and you've been in North Carolina for quite some time with your son and your daughter. Yes, right? yes, my uh, son is an opera singer, a graduate of North Carolina School of the Arts, and my daughter works in. Durham, she runs or coordinates the Dur uh, Durham City and County, their homeless programs. Well, we're pleased to have now a new, a, not a, a long time North Carolinian uh, you know, with thank experience you. other places. Thank well, you. all of this, uh, now, you know, we are right in the middle of this excitement about the help and a re looking at relationships yeah. uh, between white, either employers and their black servants are white slaveholders yes, and they're yes. uh, black slaves. Yes. And you're focused, I mean, wow, you've picked a wild <laughs> topic to jump into uh, Nat Turner. Well, you what? know, at, at the time I was writing, I didn't know anything about the help at all. Uh, but my son actually went to see it and, t and said to me, that he thought that it was a great um, lead in to what I wrote. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, okay, I agree with your son okay, about that. Okay. It, the, the lead in is that um, nobody's going to get this exactly right, but yes. that the attempts to do it lead us to great discussions. Well, I think so. And, and um, even William Styron wrote a book called The Confessions of I've Matt heard Turner. of that book, yes. yeah. And, um, and he got a lot of criticism for trying to write across racial lines. And I, I think that's unfair. I think it's part of the artist's responsibility. I think it's our responsibility as human beings to try to look across the lines and try to understand other people. And um, so while the book, The Resurrection of Nat Turner is about the historical figure, Nat Turner, and it is from an African-American perspective, um, I also ventured into writing other viewpoints, all of them not African-American. Um, some of them white women, um, some of them white men, um, because it's, I think it's my job as an artist to try to see those other viewpoints, even viewpoints that I might personally disagree with. Well, I want to get to the story, but uh, now that you've mentioned stepping into the shoes of <laughs> others, uh, you step into the shoes of a brutal slave owner. Yes, yes. And I'm not saying that you try to deal with him sympathetically. 
I, I, what, how, what did you feel your responsibility when you're dealing with somebody who's, who's a slave owner, but who might have a few good characteristics? <laughs> back then? You know, um, the character I think that you're talking about is named Nathaniel Francis. Yeah. And he was a young man at the time of Nat Turner's revolt. He was 24 years old and a slave owner. And um, some of the local historians describe him as cruel. Um, not all, because one of the people that I talked to is a descendant of, uh, of, of his, his great-grandson. I think whenever you're writing a character, you have to um, empathize with that character. You have to be willing to sit in the character and to uh, give up your own prejudices and try to write from that person's viewpoint. So I, I think it's a compliment to me to say, if you think I wrote uh, uh, sympathetically of him, I tried to be him and tried to understand how he might feel as a 24-year-old Southern white man, um, a poor man who is trying to um, gain things and the only way he's able to gain more material things, the only way he's able to gain status is by having slaves in a time when there are many who would agree with him and say it's an okay thing to do. Um, it was difficult for me, but I think that's part of the writer, the artist's job to um, tackle those things that are difficult. Well, uh, Nathaniel, this man we've been talking about, this yes. white slave owner, uh, sister owned Nat, or, or had, uh, was, her son was the owner, and she yes. had uh, supervision yes. of Nat Turner. And uh, Nathaniel, um, would you, what, tell us about Nat Turner, and if you want to, tell us about his, uh, uh, the, the relationship between Nat Turner and Nathaniel. Okay, um, Nat Turner uh, was a slave in 1831, he was actually born in 1800. And um, he led a slave revolt in Virginia in Southampton County. Um, <clears throat> and his owner, as you said, was Sally Francis. Um, and Nathaniel Francis was Sally's brother. Um, one of the things that fascinated me so much about Nathaniel Francis was some of the sources that I used were uh, actual trial records. And Nathaniel's name kept coming up in the trial records over and over again. Um, These are the trial records related to the, re the actually insurrection? Actually related to the mm -hmm. insurrection, to related to the revolt. Um, and if I can back up a little yeah, bit, yeah. The, the book that William Styron wrote in most of the history is based on this document actually called The Confessions right. of Nat Turner, written by an attorney, Thomas Gray. Well, when I went to the town um, to read the actual trial Can I interrupt you yes. to, to talk about the, the town, yes. uh, which was called, was Jer called Jerusalem. Jerusalem, is now... Courtland. Courtland, and Courtland is part of Southampton County. Southampton County. Which County. is immediately, it's in Virginia, but it's immediately north of North Northampton County, County in, in North Carolina. Which is in North Carolina. Yeah, North Carolina. Yeah. So it's close. Yes. All this has taken place Very close. either in North Carolina or close to North Carolina. Yes, yes. And um, I don't know, I just had a nagging feeling that I should go read the actual trial transcript. So I went thinking that what I'm going to read is that um, in, in the actual court records is that some annotation that Nat Turner confessed. Um, when I got there, what I read was he didn't confess. So the confessions, all of a sudden the confessions it, were something else other than well, Nat you know, Turner's confession. I have an internal fact checker brain. <laughs> I'm one of those people, I walk around and I listen to people talk. And, I, and it happens unintentionally. I guess it's sort of a writer thing. But when I listen to people talk, if, they, if what they say is consistent to me, I relax. And I go, oh, it's an honest person. If they don't, then I go, okay, I need to stay on guard. And I think it helps me in writing because I'm always checking facts, even when I don't know I'm checking them. So I went there not thinking I was checking facts, but that's really what I was doing. And I got there, and so there's no confession in the transcript. So I, actually, I was I got sick to my stomach, and I just I don't know. It, it was it's like you know you hear people talking about something that they trust that has betrayed them. 
um, like maybe a school teacher betraying a right, student. Right, right. I, I felt the same way. I, I think I have such a love of history that I want to believe that what I read, that it's true. And so standing there quickly, my brain went, okay, this is a lie. And Thomas Gray, who says he was Nat Turner's attorney, wasn't his attorney. His attorney's name was William Parker. So my brain is going And um, so it... Well, so let me just, th this, this point that you're making, I mean, th um, we're talking about fiction, your yes. uh, your, your fiction, yes. but the, maybe the most, the biggest news about your book is not the story that you tell, but the uh, story that you explode, of the, the, or that you, uh, the, the, that, that you say, that, look, we've that, been. That fact turned out to be fiction, yeah. and maybe fiction is yeah. closer to fact. <laughs> closer to yeah, fact. Yeah, and you know, and I, um, what I tr ended up trying to write in the story is the truth of what I found. I mean, of course, I had to weave in conversations and things that I don't know exactly what happened. But I did try in the book to give people more truth about what the real facts were. Well, let's were. talk a little bit about the uh, the true part. I mean, I don't. I mean, your fiction is so good that Thank that. You. that, that Thank um, I, but but lots of now that you've seen the real records. Yes. Tell us just briefly, if, as if we knew nothing, uh, about who Nat Turner was and what this slave insurrection was all about, and how it, how it and what how it got concluded. You know, the reason why I structured the book the way I did, with all these different witnesses telling you who Nat Turner was, was because. I realized that the document we've been relying on wasn't telling us who he was. And so I tried to find him, tried to define him by defining the people around him. So they, um, long ago when I was a dancer, uh, we used to talk about <laughs> defining shapes that you could either um, do it positively or you could define the things around it. And so in this I try to define the things around it and so one of the people um, that you learn about is this guy Nathaniel Francis who was basically kind of had a scam going on after Nat Turner's revolt where he was turning in slaves and getting money. Um, I, I don't know that just to me is not a good character <laughs> reference. This was after the revolt. This was after the mm -hmm. revolt. Um, All right, now I'm going to, I want you to tell me, if, if, excuse me for Yes, no problem, this, but, no but, problem. But, but Nat Turner himself is such an interesting yes. character. Tell, where did he come from? Well, his mother was one of the people I describe around him, was supposed to have been Ethiopian. Um, that's the local lore. The, the, the local... Uh, in, in Southampton County. The local historians say that his mother was Ethiopian right. and that she was brought to America as a slave, and, and which then, goes against things we've been talking right, about, the slave trade, because all of it is supposed to be work, West Coast. Now, what about his daddy? Um, well, the Confessions of Nat Turner says that his father was also an African slave, but um, there was a reward put out for Nat Turner after the revolt. They couldn't find him put out by the governor, and the reward said that he was, they described him as bright, which is um, the way people, older people in the, in the African American community, instead of saying fair skin or light, they used to mm -hmm. say the person was bright. They described him as bright, but not a mulatto. And that made my antenna go up, and I thought, why would you be so specific that he wasn't a mulatto? Um, protest too much. She doth protest too much. <laughs> he doth. Um, and so um, there's some, some of the local historians say that Nat Turner's slave owner, his owner was his father. His owner's name was Benjamin Turner, and they say that Benjamin Turner was Nat Turner's actual father. Now, uh, the other part about Nat Turner that comes out in your book, and that I guess is, is uh, an agreed upon part of the record, is mm -hmm. that he was not only bright in his color, but he was also very smart. He was very smart. He was able to read. He was able to write. Um, he could quote passages of the Bible. And he was the only slave amongst all those who went to court, and there were dozens of trials related to the revolt. He was the only one with two names. All the other slaves had one name, Hark. Sam, uh, but he was the only one 
with two names, Nat Turner. And he was also, according to the local historians, known to preach, to go around the community preaching, not just in Southampton County, but as far away as Norfolk. There were some white people who, I don't want to say had been saved by Nat Turner, yes. but who were brought into the Christian faith yes. by Nat Turner's, by this black slave's preaching. Yes, there was uh, one guy um, in particular that they talk about, uh, they talk about Nat Turner baptizing him and how what a, in an uproar the local community was over it and then that, that the guy in turn baptized Nat Turner. So you know there's a lot of stuff going on with this Mr. Turner that that makes me go okay s something was probably going on. He, had, he seemed to have privileges that the other slaves didn't have. Well all in all you got to get to the bottom of it and this is the smart guy who uses his smarts to institute a rebellion mm -hmm. against the white establishment and mm -hmm. it's uh, one that you just have to confess it's, it's, it's brutal and it's, it's brutal. Uh, and it's so um, at the at the end of the day uh, it scared whites all over the south and led to the imposition of the all of these uh, new slave laws that, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. b and and Nat Turner became kind of a monster figure he was somebody you were afraid of but now there's a little reassessment and he's some people make him a hero. How, where, how do you come down? Well, I think part of what happened in making him a monster um, is the spin that was put on it. There was a, a congressman in the mix, and it sounds like 2011, right? There, there was a congressman in Southampton County who sat at the trials as a judge who was also a colonel in the militia, so he did a lot of things. And he was feeding stories to the press. Uh, one of the first ones he fed uh, was at the the onset of the uh, rebellion or right after it finished. He said that there were two or three hundred people, uh, runaway slaves from the Great Dismal Swamp that had invaded this town and for the governor to send troops. So they sent all these troops in and the troops get there and they're like, there's nobody there. So they went around rounding up mm -hmm. who they thought might be involved. Um, and my brain just went glitch. Well, we're just talking about whether he's a hero or, oh, okay. or, or a, a somebody who's like Osama bin Laden. Okay, part of, part of him being this, this monster figure is the way he was painted. And this uh, guy, uh, Tresvant, had a lot to do with how he was painted. And, um, and the confessions, because the confessions, this document, just made him an absolute monster. Um, he wasn't able to tell his own story to the press, and so they were able to frame absolutely how it was viewed. So he, he, he's framed as a monster, but you can't escape the fact that, that, that he did use um, murder as a, part of, uh, as a part of that rebellion or, or ab massacre. Ab absolutely. Of, but you know, I, I, when I first started writing, I had um, decided that I was going to sit in the middle and I was just going to be um, this omnipotent figure <laughs> and kind of watch and, and be judge. After I learned more about what was actually going on, it was harder to hold on to, okay, this Nat Turner hor horrific figure when I realized the horrors that people on this other side are doing because, first of all, it wasn't just um, blacks involved in the revolt. There were Nottaway Indians involved in the revolt. There was one white guy, there's a historian who says that um, this guy named white Barry Newsom, that he was a white guy, that he was an indentured servant. So he was also involved in the revolt. Um, don't hear anything about Barry Newsom. And they, and they pitched it as a general uprising against all white people. And it wasn't, it was very targeted. Um, there were white farms of slave owners that they passed right by. There were Quakers passed right by. And I mean, you'd, Quakers you'd go, okay. But other white slave owning farms, if it was just a general uprising against all whites, why wouldn't they have attacked them? They didn't. The um, people generally had very specific surnames, surnames that were tied to a particular church in the town. Um, the Newsoms, the Francis's, the Whiteheads, and these people were um, 
relatives of trustees at this particular church. So I think it was a very focused and targeted. Well, this is, um, in, in the end, I just say you, you tell the you, you you tell different versions of Nat Turner and let your reader decide mm -hmm, uh, absolutely. how they feel about it. There, there's one really poignant part of your book. It's probably too hard to tell, but it, it, it relates to the relationship between, well, this is the anti-Easter mm -hmm. character who is the, you, you could put her in the help. Yeah. And, and because <laughs> she's raised a white child mm -hmm. and she has um, mixed feelings about this woman as she grows up to be an adult. Mm -hmm. uh, so so we, tell us the anti-Easter story and what anti-Easter did to her white charge when the rebellion happened? The local historians uh, say there was actually this woman, Easter, um, who saved her charge from being killed during the rebellion. And um, I was so intrigued by the story uh, that here's Easter who saves her, and then there's this other uh, person, Charlotte, who tried to kill her, uh, and that um, Nathaniel Francis pulled Easter out of, out of jail, that Easter and Charlotte were in jail. He took uh, Easter out and he took Charlotte out and he shot Charlotte. They, they tied her to a tree and shot her. I was so intrigued by the story, part of it because, you know, as a, as a child growing up, I was very resistant to the, the kind of mammy image, you know, where you're taking care of the child. I thought, oh, that's hogwash. Nobody really felt that way. But, you know, I'm, I'm more mature now. <laughs> so and, and, and I think that, um, I think there's something about love that transcends all of our, um, whatever condition we're in. It transcends race. It, and, and I'm fascinated by that. And so I tried to tell the story of this woman for whom um, her love transcended slavery and transcended persecution. I just think it's a beautiful and, and, and um, complex story, poignant story of how uh, this black woman who raised this white child who's now grown and oppressing her, yes, not treating her with respect, yes, she still loves her enough so that she will not have any part of the massacre of this particular person, although she she might not feel that way about other white people. Well, well this, you know, th the part of the lore is that, that there's a, a passage in there where I talk about them, uh, the two slaves in the kitchen with the clothes, they're dividing her clothes. That's part of the lore, that they were actually dividing the clothes. So that to me, you use the word complex. I thought you're saving her and you're fighting over her clothes, but you know, that's human nature. And, and for me, I think writing the character taught me even more about love. Well, um, since we've talked earlier about the uh, criticism that some people face when they try, as black people writing in, in the shoes of white people and black, uh, white people trying to get in the shoes of white people, what do you, I mean, how do you react to that kind of criticism? You know, I, I think that, um, Everybody has a right to criticize. Yeah, we yeah. all have free speech. <laughs> but I, you know, I, there were things, and, and I'll talk specifically about Styron's book because, um, well, let me just talk about Styron and Harry Beecher Stowe, two people that I was reading um, before I started writing. I think that, that um, um, Styron did a great thing trying to write because I think we're supposed to venture across those barriers. What a boring world if all we do is sit in, you know, in our own boxes and never come outside. So you, a gentle criticism, you say, I'm so glad he tried, he didn't quite get, he, he pushed the envelope a little bit. I think but. he tried. Um, sometimes I, um, he was also friends with James Baldwin. And I think at the time he was writing, at least part of the time, James Baldwin was living in his guest house. So my criticism often has been of James James Baldwin. I was like, why weren't well, you a better writer friend and say, you know, brother, try this a little bit. And um, but I, I, I think he gets credit for trying. I think we all need to continue to try. And I think we all ought to be better friends <laughs> and help each other do better. Um, Harriet Beecher Stowe 
On the other hand, I think her... I guess just for the other... She tried to write about this, yes, uh, yes, this, yes. this event as well. She, she wrote uh, she, a book called uh, Dread, A Tale of the Great Dismal Swamp. And she struggled in her own way, but I think there are things that she got better than Styron did. Um, I hope, um, sitting here, hoping I'm not sprinkling bad juju on myself, <laughs> is that, um, that I... Um, I tried to do it, you know, and I hope that I have done a good job. It's certainly not the first time that I've written across racial well, boundaries. This is probably, I mean, I, I hate to end this conversation. We're just getting started, <laughs> but we got to end. It might be a good place to stop because I think it's, it just goes with that saying that uh, you've tried and you've succeeded in bringing a whole new uh, look at Nat Turner and telling a real good story at the same time. So uh, thanks for your book thank and, you. and its sequel, which is coming out uh, as really as we speak. Um, and for taking the time to visit with us today. Thank you so much, thank you. Uh, our guest has been Sharon Ewell Foster, and she's the author of The Resurrection of Nat Turner. It's really in two volumes. We talked about the first part one, The Witnesses. We're so glad to have had her today, and also have you join us, and I hope that you'll be back with us same time next week when we visit with another one of North Carolina's great authors. Funding for North Carolina Book Watch is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV, and by the North Carolina Humanities Council.